Yes, it's already live now, actually. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you very much, then. I, my apologies for uh, joining late. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you all. Uh, uh in in the uh, uh uh in the uh, uh business toughness uh, during uh, covid-19 session uh, uh definitely the last uh, nine months uh, have been very tough for 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 all the economies of the world and the business was tough uh, during this health uh, crisis uh, in our session uh, we will uh, uh discuss uh, the strategic management is being tested uh, during the unique covid uh, pandemic many firms demand uh, more cash uh, be available to make their uh, regular activities and more resilient uh, what more can be done to support firms uh, will leaders be strong enough to uh, take far reaching decisions uh, while facing potential bankruptcy what is the best role for the government and everything these are the things that we will be discussing discussing today uh, we have a great uh, panelist uh, from five countries so let me just briefly introduce uh, 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 our first uh, panelist is uh, aneda aneda uh, excuse my 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 pronunciation if i do uh, in advance you know aneda setio evento from president director from pt avena synergy international uh, and he is running a joint venture investment holding company uh, between japan and and indonesia with more than 10 years of experience and expertise in renewable energy environment and mnh consultancy employing more than 100 uh, employees uh, poses strong relationship with japan and more than 16 year related to education business and social Uh, ventures uh, and it is becoming a one stop solution approach for creation and growing new sustainable business between indonesia and japan uh, i like to welcome uh, and now the second uh, uh, <coughs> panelist which we have from ajer bolisser chief ceo of uh, peglas group uh, philippines uh, uh, he is started his career in 1975 with prestigious uh, uh, philippine accounting firm ernest and young he shortly thereafter returned to his country origin and venturing into uh, pioneering and large scale agriculture projects uh, uh, in economically disadvantaged communities uh, most particularly in the high challenging culture and uh, conflict ridden areas in mandano uh, he is a firm believer in the edge and health is wealth uh, thing is very important uh, right now uh, looking forward to reach his golden age of 70 while continuing to work gainfully in both private and government sectors welcome uh, to the panel uh, third uh, we have uh, haley Sadington, uh, the CEO of Halo Medical Devices, uh, as a and uh, as a founder of uh, CEO of Profile, that as a founder and CEO of innovating in the fast evolving world of medical devices, uh, Haley is a focus on building teams uh, that globally scale on uh, uh, med tech innovation, uh, while the core focus on technologies uh, that help uh, people functions uh, optimally uh, commercialize in the world most accurate. genometer okay a tool used to measure a patient movement after injury okay is a healthcare so very important as a as a world economic forum young global leader uh, really is focused on un sdgs on uh, health equity creating an uh, equality to healthcare so that's very important you know welcome to the uh, session Thank and you. now we have uh, 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 mr shashi karin uh, shetty uh, who is the chairman of all cargo logistic uh, Uh, EC, ECU Worldwide and Getty Limited. Uh, he's a founder and chairman uh, of All Cargo Logistics India, uh, biggest integrated logistics services provider and a global uh, LCL consolidation leader. Uh, the group operate for in more than 160 countries uh, through more than 300 offices, employing more than 10,000 team members and generate revenue of approximately USD. 1.2 billion dollar you know i like to welcome you uh, in in our uh, session today i'll mm. be very and now we have from uh, i believe from japan uh, the dero kawada the president of uh, kawada technologies a tokyo stock exchange listed company uh, parent of kawada group uh, the kawada group includes uh, kawada industries which manufactures and fabrics high quality steel structure Uh, including iconic expensive bridges skyscrapers and dome stadium stadiums uh, so i must be busy in the olympics uh, i believe uh, okay kawada all 
have other businesses span on a wide range of construction works in environmental solutions, aircraft operation, to ICT, to new generation robotic. You know, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'll be brief, uh, introduce myself. I'm uh, Tariq Evan Nizami, the founder and uh, CEO of uh, CEO Club Network uh, Worldwide, which is the largest uh, three-decade-old organization, uh, presence in 100 countries. Uh, I'm holding a... a uh, international company based in U.S., interest in real estate, entertainment, healthcare, education, IT, and other. So I don't want to be too much, but I want to mention one thing. The last month I was appointed as the uh, vice chairman for United Nations uh, Disaster Risk Reduction, which is UNDRR in, in UAE. So I'm very excited on that, you know. And lastly, I'm a advisor to the uh, Chinese government for their... Uh, uh, international marketing advisor for their upcoming first made um, uh, island, the commercial island they are coming up. So now, uh, I, sorry for the late start again. I will start the panel discussion uh, with asking a, a question. So let me ask. Uh, uh, I know the topic is very big, but we have very limited time. Uh, so let me share uh, that the first question is with uh, uh, Aneda. Uh, and if I can ask uh, that, how did you adjust in COVID-19 situation to maintain the resiliency of, of your company? I know it was a very uh, tough time for all of us uh, this year, uh, but uh, can I have your uh, reply, please? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, really happy to be here uh, as part of uh, Horace's Extraordinary Meeting. It's a great honor for me to be here. Thank you very much uh, for welcoming uh, me here. So yes, uh, this is really a tough time for uh, not only for uh, us, uh, but I guess it's for everyone. And uh, we really need to have uh, 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 to have some great effort on how we should adjust with the current situation. And definitely, uh, we are being resilient uh, uh, because I think it th uh, thanks to the uh, great uh, relationship uh, that we have with the clients that we have been uh, working very hard to establish trust uh, with them for the past ten years. And I believe that those this, the trust really uh, came in the right time uh, when, uh, especially in difficult times like we are facing now, I believe that uh, uh, we can be survive and we still have uh, some clients that we can work and get, getting trust uh, because uh, the, the reputation that we have been building for the past 10 years. And uh, I think that uh, related to that, uh, we, we, we believe that uh, uh, everything is just being delayed uh, uh, for 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 next year. Uh, we we, we uh, that, so that's why I think that uh, uh, this is not the time where we should be pessimistic. But I think this is a time where we should be remaining optimistic. And I think being optimistic is really important uh, in these uh, times uh, to maintain our resilience. And uh, that's why even though it's difficult to meet with people, but through this, uh, uh, of course, we have to switch ourselves into online mode like this. And I really make it to the most uh, of this uh, communication platform, uh, including internally and externally. And I'm attending a lot of uh, uh, sessions, online sessions, uh, learning a lot of th new things. It's like I'm returning back to university, <laughs> yeah, but without degree, you know, and collecting certificates here and there. So it's, it's, it's really quite an enjoying uh, uh, experience, which maybe I could not get this if, you know, during the normal times, I'm busy meeting people here and there. So, yeah, that will be my first take on the nice. question yeah. that you asked. Thank no, you very much. Definitely the last uh, few months has been eye-opener to all of us, actually. You know, it doesn't matter which part of the world we are in, you know. So uh, uh, let me ask you, I mean, I know we have, um, I have to squeeze in, you know, everybody, you know. Uh, we have uh, Ed here uh, from Philippines, uh, or I think we lose, we lost one of our panelists, but somehow technically. Uh, I think, Ed, are you there or no? Okay, so uh, uh, okay. Let me ask a question with Haley. Uh, that uh, uh, the COVID uh, has placed a demand on companies to rapidly transform their environment to enable production to continue. Uh, it is the nimble innovation company that pivot first the companies who already have the strategies such as working from home in place during COVID. You know how how do you uh, how would your response would be on that? I think what I've seen in our economy and within our company as well is the flexible environments that were already in place were most suited to adapt quickly to, to COVID. Um, for example, we've had 23,000 cases, a very small number compared to um, global statistics of, of COVID since January when our first 
uh, case was confirmed. And from from that point, we were seeing a lot of uh, companies adapt to work at home um, environments and setting people up. So looking after um, employees from a somatic point of view, making sure they were getting exercise and offering you know creative ways to do that through through companies, and also um, making sure mental and you know psychological uh, well being was also looked after. So we saw an adoption of tools to make sure that happened. There was a lot of extra check-ins, Zoom calls, uh, phone calls, um, things you would normally do in the office in face-to-face, but being at home, we really needed to uh, make sure we were looking after people in a higher communicative sort of way. So that's what we saw here happen. Yeah, I think, you know, definitely, you know, I think these virtual meetings are becoming a a part of our daily life now uh, and everything else, you know. (laughs) I'll move on to uh, Mr. Shashi uh, Shetty. You know, you are involved in the logistic and and I know that was the main, uh, one of the main things, uh, tasks and challenging tasks during this last COVID uh, crisis that is still going on, you know. Uh, My question to you that what leadership skills, according to you, are most relevant in such times like this? Yeah, thank you uh, very much. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this conference. Uh, you know, if I have to write, uh, talk about uh, uh, what all one had to go through in this last six months, I think one can easily write a book, right? So uh, so there is so much uh, that one had to do uh, in terms of uh, engaging your people, engaging your customer, engaging your industry, um, you know, basically communicate and create an environment of security in a time when uh, the whole humanity was in loss. What would happen? Everybody were worried and everybody were looking uh, what's the future uh, for them, etc. In a time like this, uh, what we try to do is try to build an environment where people feel safe and secured and, 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 and c- continuously give that message particularly to our people and to their families that, uh, look, it's, uh, you know, there are good times, there's bad times, and uh, we continue to keep that uh, motivation in the people. And the second thing that we continue to communicate with people is that, you know, every crisis brings opportunity, uh, which many of us have experienced and witnessed. And we, act, as a matter of fact, as an organization, started with two very major projects on transformation, uh, you know, uh, transformation of the business, uh, in terms of um, the future readiness, in terms of technology, in terms of financial restructuring uh, and uh, organization restructuring and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, a lot of, as everybody said, a lot of time was spent in calls and learning new things and uh, how to get yourself adopted to that. Um, yeah, you know, and I think generally uh, being more more empathetic to uh, the situation than 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 in the past so right yeah. right yeah no no but i think the challenge is still going on right so the people are a little bit more used to than what they are right uh, now you right. know where you stand uh, the mortality rate is low people know that there are medication available but the first two three months was very very difficult right yeah, so, so, the, the, so the learning curve for all of us you know exactly yeah, really yeah. you know yeah no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shetty. Uh, now I move back, go to Japan, you know, uh, Mr. Kawada, you know, that how do you, how things are in Japan? You know, how is the Japanese government coping with this COVID? You know, I mean, Japanese government is very always uh, way ahead of all those uh, crises, you know. So how, how did they cope with this COVID crisis in there? I um, personally think that the government have done that great of a job. Uh, we we're very lucky that the, uh, the number of total uh, people affected, uh, infected, have been about 80,000. And uh, uh, let's see here. I have a close newest number. Uh, we have uh, 1,500 people uh, that died from it. Uh, oh. which, which is a big number for Japan, uh, but uh, compared to places like uh, or India and, and U.S. It's much smaller, but uh, uh, Japan uh, since the after uh, World War II, uh, the government really doesn't have a very strong power to to do lockdown and things like that. So it's been like asking people to stay home, asking businesses to close, 
so there is, we never had the uh, uh, very hard lockdown. So uh, uh, we, we, we we're in the middle of a second uh, uh, wave already. Uh, but uh, uh, it's and, and we have a culture of wearing masks and washing hands and we don't shake hands, we bow to each other. So um, I think those might be the, uh, it's not the government's doing, the, it's not the government that did a real good job, but uh, I think the, uh, there's a cultural thing that, that really helped. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's each and every of us uh, responsibility to, to how to uh, uh, react and how to be a responsible citizen. Uh, that's the only way we can fight uh, uh, these kind of a crisis, you know, uh, because it's not uh, area wise, it's a worldwide, you know, so it's, it's definitely have a different a way of handling the situation uh, and everything else. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, let me go back to uh, Ananda. Uh, and let me ask a question uh, that uh, uh, have your government in, in Indonesia, you know, have done enough to support the business facing COVID-19 and how it could be better? <clears throat> yes, uh, definitely we we can, cons- I can consider that Indonesia is not in the best uh, way uh, of trying to uh, support the uh, private sector, although they're trying very hard. Uh, but I think uh, they're not really trying to be on the spot to really support and transforming uh, the industry so that we can uh, adapt, uh, adapt, adapting to this new situation that we are facing now. So, and uh, well, you can say that uh, we have a limited of uh, state budget to support anyways, you know. So we, we, we do have those temporary support uh, to some industries like, uh, you know, uh, 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 some uh, what do you call it bailout? Uh, not bailout is like a subsidy that is being given to uh, uh, companies or individuals, but it's it's not much, you know. And uh, we're a bit uh, slow to respond uh, to this uh, pandemic situation. Uh, and I think the the there's a but I think this uh, situation really open up some problems that we need to uh, solve uh, within the the country itself uh, uh, let's say coming from the database or the big data of this uh, 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 what do you call it that uh, from the, the the citizen the citizen data uh, the public data that we have right now is in the in the is in the brink of uh, reform uh, uh, that needs need to be done so that we can actually give support to the uh, right person and also related to the informal sectors uh, that we have right now is uh, we need to uh, somehow making sure that they also being part of the uh, assistance and support being given by the government. So this really is a great call, uh, a great wake up call for the Indonesian government to reform ourselves. But I'm just uh, worrying where, how far or how, how swiftly or how effectively we can, uh, the government can uh, change or reform uh, with this uh, pandemic situation, you know. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I know that they're trying very hard to uh, 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 bring investors coming in. But I think uh, it's really difficult to uh, to bring them in if we don't have some clear policy related to how we should solve this uh, pandemic situation and all. And as in, as uh, because now we're still like 3,000, 4,000 people in, uh, for the daily uh, effect, uh, nearly infected uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, patients. So uh, I think we need to improve testing and tracing and treatment. And we need to really stick to the data and facts. And we need to have more the Ministry of Health to be active, you know, uh, and bring uh, uh, what they call clarity and calmness to the people that this is something that is uh, well taken care of, which we still, which we hope, which we are still hoping that he can give a better effort on that. So, uh, uh, but then again, uh, it's really an eye opener for the Indonesian government and also eye opener for the citizen, uh, especially for myself, uh, to see how the government should move uh, to the next phase, uh, especially uh, on uh, facing uh, the the future of of Indonesia, where we hope to be uh, the fourth largest uh, country in 2045, but this pandemic really changed the scenario. So we we really look forward to see how we can uh, help the government to uh, ha- adjust the planning so that we can still uh, grow uh, in, in a sustainable way in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, no, thank you. I think you were mentioned very key word, you know, data. I mean, the right data in this, in this time is very important. That's how you see, just like a business, if you don't know how many people you have to approach or how many people you have to provide a solution, the data, the valid data, I think is right now is, is very important. And especially a country like India and Indonesia, the large population, it is very important how to cope with that, you know. So I think Indonesia, I can understand. And also India is going through that, you know, I think because it's such a huge country and and, and and all level of citizens are there, you know, the educated, non-educated, daily worker, business people and enterprise. So I think it's very tough job for governments to to maintain and keep them informed and keep the their their plan going. And that's very important. They all have plans, but is how to implement and how to educate people, citizens, I think is a very tough position. But I, I hope uh, that things get better uh, in Indonesia. Uh, let me ask a, a question to, uh, with Haley now, because you are in, in the medical services, you know, and I think it's all we talk about uh, healthcare. Uh, my question to you that people still uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 remains the number one commodity to generate growth and scale in business. Uh, and COVID had forced these leading businesses on how to best look after the people, addressing what people need to survive and thrive. You know, how what, what would you say? Yeah, I think I can certainly comment to what we've done here in Australia. Um, and the government's tremendously contributed to that, that well-being of seeing people thrive uh, and, and survive initially as well. We're on the tail end of a, well, we, we hope a tail end of the second wave with 17 new confirmed cases of COVID today. We've certainly seen um, and put in place economic development groups to make sure people on, on a whole as a nation are, are starting to, to come through this. We're seeing healthcare actually increase in terms of health services and social services attributed to looking after people's psychological and um, mental wellbeing increased by about 9% during COVID. Um, and, and a lot of structures in place which are now tapering off with a, a very clear roadmap from our government um, that companies, private and um, government companies are following in terms of making sure we're on the road out of this. So work at home packages, free child cares is what we've seen, increased um, business mentorship hours as well for, for leaders. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of support. Okay, no, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time. So I will ask a, a, a question now with uh, Mr. Shashi. You know, what would be your recommendation to enterprise and small, medium scale organizations and to survive through this such, such a different situation? You know, what would be organized for the organization and the management and cash flow? Uh, if you can be a little brief, we have only a few minutes left now to close the session. Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, uh, I don't want to add more on the government side. I think thankfully India had a very strong political leader and was very decisive, both in terms of protecting the people and bringing the facilities for managing the crisis. And fortunately, India's death rate is also very, very small compared to the population size. Right. Uh, second part is the government has done tremendous amount of work in terms of liberalizing and supporting businesses. And one of them is the small and medium enterprises. They gave a tremendous amount of uh, subsidies moratorium for the loans, uh, you know, several steps in the area of labor reforms, the law, uh, uh, the many other kind of reforms that they've been able to come in time for the businesses to support. And I think my advice to small and medium enterprises is that, you know, one obviously is a very simple thing to make sure that there's enough cash flow. More than that, I think I would say there is a lot of duplicity there. A lot of people doing the same thing. So I think a greater amount of collaboration among the industry, among the competition is what I think uh, the small and medium enterprises should explore. And um, with that, you can you know bring a product cost lower. Uh, and, um, you know, the other very important thing is when you have time, time to think about how you can offer better innovative products, services for the future. World is going to change, um, you know, and the businesses need to change to face the future. Uh, if they have to survive. Definitely, you know, I think survival is a key issue right now. Sustaining business is a key issue, you know. Uh, let me ask a, a quick question uh, with uh, Mr. Kavanda that what are the, some of the new Japanese prime minister ideas to cope in this current situation uh, there? If you can be very brief, please. Uh. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Mr. Suga was uh, uh, 
uh, has been helping Mr. Abe for many, many years. So he understands what Mr. Abe wanted to do. I mean, he had Mr. Abe had to leave because of his health conditions, but uh, now he he's continuing with his uh, uh, direction. One, uh, but but th there have been many inefficiencies, like uh, subsidies and the money that the government wanted to give to people were not not that quickly uh, given because of the uh, bureau bureaucratic uh, inefficiencies. So he really wanted to change that by establishing a digital agency, for one. And also another one is to uh, break down the walls between the uh, government uh, uh, departments. So uh, those are two things he's really pushing, and I hope uh, he can do it and uh, we'll be more efficient uh, country and and uh, COVID situation will be contained. I see, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I think we have to end this. Uh, I think it's a very big subject, but uh, we cannot uh, complete in such a short time, you know. So I think it was all, uh, I wonder, in conclude, I like to say that it was definitely a wake-up call uh, and we all had to go to our drawing board uh, to, to uh, in our businesses to sustain and make the changes required to survive and everything else, you know. And I hope uh, things get better soon. And we go back to our normal business life. Uh, I'd like to thank each one of you uh, uh, on behalf of Horaces, uh, all the panelists who have uh, uh, joined us uh, today, and most of all, all the participants uh, from all over the world who have given their, their time. I appreciate, I also appreciate and thank all, all of you uh, for your valuable input uh, uh, and, and during this session, and, and we all did a great job. And in last, I'd like to thank on in, in the Mr. Frank Richter of Horaces for giving us the opportunity and, and sharing our thoughts and hosting this great Horaces extraordinary uh, meeting today. Uh, he has been very active all over the world and I think doing, always doing a great job bringing in good people and good group of people for the valuable inputs and everything else. So in last, I just want to say, just be safe wherever you are. Hope the world will come back much stronger and more peaceful place to live and always be healthy and happy. So thank you very much for joining uh, us today and, and enjoy the rest of the session uh, in this valuable uh, event today. You know, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, take yeah. care. Thank you very Great. much. See you all. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. I don't. Okay, I will. I will end now. All right. Okay. I was waiting for everybody to leave. <laughs> then I will end. Yeah. Okay. See you then. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>